Uh, my name is Bob Jones. Uh, I'm 81. I've been carving decoys for, I guess, about 65 years. And I got started in 1953. We wanted to go duck hunting and we couldn't afford to buy decoys. <laughs> A friend of mine, his dad was one of the best carvers in the country at the time. And he got us to carve in our decoys. And that's how we got started. These were probably two of the first ones that I, I made right here. This is a uh, bubblehead decoy. Uh, it was made right around probably 1953 or 54. It's hollow cedar. And it's just a strictly a hunting decoy. It has some bird shot in it still, but it still has the original paint from the 50s. Uh, this one was made several years later. This was a, a broad bill, which is hollow inside. We was doing it for just at the time for hunting. And then uh, decoys were becoming popular for collect. They've always been collectibles, but really getting popular in the 50s and 60s uh, from two old time carvers that lived in Crisfield, Maryland. Lem and Steve Ward, there were two brothers, and they were the ones that carved together. They had an old barn on the bay front of the Chesapeake Bay, and that's where they did all the carving. You have to visualize the duck. You know, I, I know most of them from hunting the ducks, the shapes. If, if you're not sure, you have to check a reference book. And then you sketch the pattern out on a piece of paper. Once you get it the way you like it, you transfer it to a piece of wood and you carve it by hand using a, a, a knife, several knives, uh, a draw knife, smoke shaves, and some little machine tools like a Fordham tool to shape the block of wood. Then I ship it out, and I or I make the, the pattern myself out of hardwood for one of the machines I use. Sometimes I use hard maple. Uh, sometimes we use aluminum for the master pattern on the machine. I worked on a railroad for 20 years, and I did the decoys during the day. I worked on a railroad at night and did the decoys in the daytime. So it became too much after a while. So I left the railroad in 1981 after 20 years, and I went into doing the decoys full time. And then that developed into a business. We started doing wildlife art shows all up and down the East Coast and as far as Santa Rosa, California, uh, North Carolina. And then we got into doing the fish and we started getting into craft shows. I enjoy doing the shows and meeting people. And uh, I give Bob a break so he can go get a burger <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> And whatever, there was a decoy show we was probably in at the time. Well, since Bob and I got married, it's been an adventure because we've done a lot of traveling and met a lot of people. Uh, Bob's well known among uh, the carvers. And I think that pleases me and just makes me um, aware of how many people he has touched, you know, in, in his life. That's dusty. We have about uh, 150 to 200 decoys, maybe more. This is a uh, part of my collection, and most of my collection is there's two birds, the male and female. This is the male wood duck. It's a hollow cedar decoy. It's a New Jersey style because it's kind of rounded. Instead of a flat bottom, it's rounded, and they, they rock like that in the water. This is a hooded merganser. Uh, this was made by a fellow by the name of John Holloway, who's another decoy maker. This is also hollow cedar. It has a weight embedded in the bottom that's lead to keep the decoy upright. So when it turns over, it flips back up again. And of course, it has your, your leather for the decoy weight and line that you throw in the water. And then this one, a little story behind it. This is a uh, old squaw, or they call it now long-tailed duck. It's hollow pine. It was made by the fellow by the name of Harry Waite, who's since passed away. But he, he made his decoys a little bit larger 
than they should be. And back in the 70s, he took a decoy, he hollowed it out, he put a inch and a quarter round hole on it with a wooden plug that would screw in. So when he passed away, his ashes would be put in that decoy and set loose on Chesapeake Bay and hope another hunter would find it, put it on the mantle. So Sports of Field, the magazine got a hold of that and they did a two page article in one of their issues about these coffin ducks. He sold a lot of them, but people were using them for coffins for their Labrador retrievers and their dogs and stuff where they would put the ashes inside the, the decoy. As I said, each phase has been an adventure, you know, learning what kind of ducks they were. Because if I didn't, I got McDonald's. If I knew the ducks, we got a nice steak dinner. <laughs> My style would basically be a Barnegat Bay style. Uh, or a Chesapeake style. Chesapeake style was more of a flat bottom. Barnegat Bay had a rounded bottom to the decoy. Delaware River was also rounded, but they had a carved V-wing like this in the back. They were all basically the same, no matter what species it was. So I could look at a decoy and just about tell you what part of the country it's from. So that's, that's it, and I have a lot of others. I have, like I said, 150 or so decoys in the collection from different people that I knew uh, that I hunted with at the time, or I knew personally. And that's the reason I bought them. At the time, I didn't buy them for the monetary value. It was just something personal with me and the, the fellas that carved them. It's all been very interesting. And you get to hear other carvers tell their stories and you realize how much you have in common with them. And, uh, the newer carvers are totally different than the old carvers that Bob and I knew. When you talk with them, you heard stories, and good, bad, and the ugly. When Bob and I were first going together, I was really just amazed at his shop. And, uh, I, you know, meeting some of his friends and the things that they had done, I thought, I can do that. So I made a replica of Bob's shop that he had down in Wading River, New Jersey, uh, complete with a dog. It's all enjoyable to me. But I get disgusted some days like anybody does, but you get up the next day and you're twice as better. And my good wife, Linda, keeps me going. You know, she she's behind me. I couldn't do it without her uh, 100%. Linda says she, she doesn't paint. She keeps, she does the best part of the business. She takes care of the books and keeps me straight on that. And that's half of the business right there. And then she's behind almost everything I do. If I want to buy a new piece of machinery, she kind of looks at me a little funny sometimes, but we kind of work it out. <laughs> Just uh, continue doing it as long as I can, you know, and as long as my hands work and my feet get me out to the shop, I'll be able to do it maybe, maybe to a hundred, but I don't know. <laughs> so.